this morning we have quite a tangled web, and uh, I have to ask you to follow along as we recapitulate some of the material we've already discussed. We have discussed that in the present cycle of evolution, we are working through four levels, physical, ethereal or vital, emotional and mental. These are the four divisions of creatures that are on the earth at the present time and involved in this cycle of growth. Now, in the human being, this cycle is repeated in the material world in bodies. The physical body corresponds to the earth. The vital growth of the dimension of growth or development, water. The emotional nature, fire. And the mental nature, air. The four elements of antiquity are repeated in this pattern. Now, if we go back into the philosophies of the past, we realize that every civilization has observed these four levels with great care. They are involved in the rights of citizenship, in the tribe, in the race, in the nation, and in the human family. Every one of the great civilizations of the past had a rule or law which was very closely and carefully enforced. No individual was born a citizen. This is very important. He was not born equal. He had to attain equality. He had to prove definitely that he could administer the faculties and powers which were developing within him in the age of growth. Therefore, in most nations, there were puberty rights. One of, those, one of the nations that performed this closely was Egypt. And the Egyptian child had a little lock of hair that hung over the forehead. Only when they reached a certain age was this lock cut off. And that was the beginning of their acceptance into the family of adults. Now, in order to pass the test for this puberty right, very definite instruction was given by the family, by the state, and particularly by the priesthood. It was told it out to this young person that he was becoming a member of a family. But up to this point, the family had protected him. But when he became an individual, he had to protect both himself and the family. It was indispensable to the community that he carry his share of the responsibility of adulthood. Later, we have other rights of different level developments. Both the uh, men and women have the same puberty rights. Both regarded were regarded as part of the family, and that they became a citizen. They had to take on not only the honors of citizenship, the privileges of citizenship, but the duties of citizenship. And it was in this point that we had gradually lost sight of the facts of life. We no longer recognize this vision, but it is nevertheless there. We now, or did up to recently, declare that a child could not vote until it was 21 years old. Now it can vote at 18. We kind of amended the constitution of nature, but that didn't mean anything to nature. That was our own uh, arbitrary division. The fact remains that as every child grows, it not only has new opportunities, but new responsibilities. And it is only when opportunity and responsibility are brought together in a happy pattern that progress is possible in a community. Now, we have today a recognition also of another factor in this ladder of steps upward from physical body to mental integrity. These steps, of course, are first the physical body, infancy, and the gradual processes of physical growth. But in this process, the individual is nursed by the great nurse, the earth. The, uh, the infancy of the individual is always administered finally by the fecundity of nature. 
and it is administered in particular through parenthood and through the ancestry of the line. Later, the child goes into the period of growth, and that becomes the period of water, corresponding to the vegetable kingdom. And here it becomes gradually assimilated to the pattern of the levels of life upon which it is to function in maturity. The animal comes into the third uh, animal, or even the element, the fire level. Here the, the, the animal is subject to the laws of emotional existence. These laws are not set by the animal. They are set by nature. And they are set because they are the only way in which protoplasm can gradually evolve into deity. Where every atom gradually becomes a deified being. It is all growth under law. Growth under responsibility. Growth under the burden of carrying our share of the responsibility for life. And finally, in after education, which is under the fire level, we come to the man. We come to the individualization. Here the individual becomes self-responsible. And in being self-responsible, he comes into contact with the mysterious element of air. Now, up to uh, through the animal kingdom, the nature is governed by various orders or hierarchies. These orders administer the substances which are necessary in the building of the composite nature of the human being. When it comes, however, to the mental level, it comes to the threshold of individuality. And individuality is the factor that is largely influenced by the mental potential of the human being. Now, the mind is a very interesting instrument. It is something that we all are concerned with. It is something that is constantly causing us wonder and has brought us from flint and stone. It brought us from the beginning of life up to the computer and how we don't know how much further. But all these things arise out of the mental dimension of the uh, universal pattern. In India, among the Eastern people, the mind is divided into two levels, high mind or higher mind and ordinary or mortal mind. These are according, according to the ancient rule, are rupa and arupa, formed and unformed, visible and invisible, human and divine. The uh, mental agency, therefore, is a tremendous potential within the individual. In other words, the mind is something that develops inside of us. It is not something that is hung on the outside. It is not an added factor. It is an evolved factor. It is something that becomes obvious, visible, and tangible because it is in our own nature to unfold this way. Now, what we call the uh, mental faculty intelligence. And we know that this intelligence, as Lord Bacon points out, is two-sided or two-edged. It is, first of all, the ability of the individual to observe. And most all primitive people are observationalists. They study all things in terms of appearance or what they see happening. This was how primitive life evolved. But as long as this observation was accurate, the primitive life grew in proper pattern. And nearly all the scriptures of mankind are based upon the observation of the natural or primitive way of life, the laws, the inevitable laws that govern all processes in nature. Now, in this problem of mind, we therefore have the mind principle within the individual. And we have the mind consequences in society. We know that nearly all that we can possibly think of as having been achieved in civilization has come forth out of the individual. It has not come from the outside, but it has caused to evolve or develop around itself an external structure. Therefore, we have both intelligence, which is internal, and intellectualism, which is external. And these two forms of intelligence were recognized by the Greeks who built their philosophies upon it. 
This prayer, therefore, consequently provides us with opportunity. First of all, environment inspires us to release internal potential. We find ourselves in a world of infinite potential, infinite opportunity, and we feel impelled to advance along the lines of these opportunities. But it also prepares us or bestows upon us something else. That is the responsibility of recognizing the consequence of depending entirely upon an external for an internal growth. We are more or less confronted, therefore, with living with the internal potential, which must always be in the line of growth. And the consequences of that potential in society, which is gradually building an imaginary or illusionary structure to the misuse and abuse of potential. We have, therefore, today in the world a world of people living as a result of thought. But the thought they are living from has been brought through from an internal integrity to an external compromise. The compromise being the determination to exploit resource rather than to use it. The mind says whatever power we have should be used correctly. Ambitions and appetites say we should use it to our own advantage. Then for the internal mind then says what is our advantage? And the answer of course is the real advantage is to keep the rule. The disadvantage is to try to break it. And almost all your scriptural writings of the world, the right Bibles of mankind, are really developments in words and thoughts of the proven experiences of humanity as to the reality of the victory of integrity over indulgence, the victory of truth over error, the victory of intelligence over ignorance. All these factors have to be taken into consideration. But out of it all comes a real recognition that we have two basic sources of knowledge. We come into the world, therefore, and we pass through the various stages of childhood. We go to school and we finally come out into individual life. Our school period is represented by the animal kingdom. Therefore, that is what is supposed to prepare us within ourselves for the individualization of our mental nature. Now, when we go to school, what do we learn? This is all largely a matter of the, the development of an educational theory. Now, this can be developed in two ways. First, by listening to the voice from within, which tells us the reality of these matters and the voice that comes from the outside, which is largely self-centered and to the advantage of the moment at the expense of eternity. So we recognize that the problem of education is something we begin to thought, think about very carefully. When you go to school, you are supposed to learn <coughs> how to live. <coughs> learn how to live. You're supposed to learn the proper way of using the resources which have been bestowed upon you. The education, therefore, is actually a process for releasing or bringing forth into manifestation the eternal wisdom that rests in universal mind. It is the individual that change that taking his place in the universal plan of things on a mental level. He must, he must learn to obey the beginning and all truth the nature. The beginning rests in obedience. The moment we disobey, we endanger our own survival, and very largely endanger the survival of the civilization to which we belong. So we say, when you go to school, you should learn something. You should learn what nature wants, what the universal laws demand and not what the selfish human beings wish to do. We are now basing our education almost entirely upon the corruptions and misfortunes of selfishness, egotism, and exploitation. We are subtly teaching the new generation to exploit 
the members of itself. We are teaching them to keep on with the processes which have already failed with us. We are teaching them that the purpose for life is wealth and fame and gratification. This is not true. And as long as this is the basis of education, the wisdom principle within ourselves is stymied. The inner life is gradually blocked out because it is invisible, because it is causal, and because the average person doesn't know he has it. And in the place of it is this material adjustment by which he seems to be able to become rich and famous and can also fall into all the bad habits, crimes, and delinquencies that afflict us today. It becomes obvious, therefore, that our education is coming from the outside when it should be a release from within of the mental potential. The mind is not materialistic. The mind is not selfish. The mind is not self-centered. These are the consequences of compromising it for the advantage of personal success. We take this thread, this thread of the mind which we have in us and we gradually condition it so that instead of being the leader of our life, it becomes the slave of our appetites. We use the mind and we abuse it. We do not recognize it that it is the source of our greatest happiness and greatest security if we use it properly. If, however, we tarnish it as we have done in centuries gone by, we will gradually use the mind as a destroyer and will then blame the mind for the misuse of itself, while the actual blame lies within the person who has forgotten to, to fulfill the proper destiny for which man was created. Man was to be created as a leader over the elements and over the visible kingdoms of nature. And at the present moment of all the kingdoms, he is probably the least honest. Animals are not dishonest. Plants are not dishonest. Minerals certainly are not dishonest. We do not recognize these virtues in them at all. But they have no fault because they have no individuality. They are under group leadership and each fulfills that which is necessary to advance the collective. We have reached the point in mental individuality where we are not considering the collective. We are not doing the things that make the greater good for all. We are doing that which we feel is the greatest good for ourselves, or those small groups to which we belong. We have done exactly the same thing in politics, religion, ethics, education, economy, and, so, and all the divisions of society. Everything now is the fulfillment of personal ambition, and no consideration for that which is the basic reason for being here. We are not here by accident, even though it might seem biologically that we are. We are here because there is a group entity which is sending forth these beings into the material distance in order to teach them one of the greatest rules and laws in life, and that is to keep the rule. We find that actually, from the cradle to the grave, we are passing through initiational tests. We are being tried, we are being weighed in the balance, we are being subjected to disciplines of various kinds, and there can be no peace, no security, no true growth in the world until the individual uh, accepts the discipline, lives according to it, and shares the new wisdom that he develops with others of a similar nature and works together with others for the betterment of the entire. And so these principles are well understood. The uh, problem is very difficult. Uh, Comenius, the Moravian educator, gave us the secret of the public school system. He tells us very simply that the reason for the public school is to teach us the importance of working together for the common good. That education, educo, is from the word which means to draw forth, to bring out from within ourselves certain knowledge that is inherent. And this knowledge which is inherent is the most important of all. That is the truest knowledge that we have. 
Knowledge from the outside may lead to skill in the arts and sciences, but it does not lead to the perfection of integrity. All that is good in man's philosophy comes from within himself. All that is a mistake comes from following the examples of those who have failed to achieve individual integration. So we have now, as Khomeini has said, and what uh, has later been said by a number of others, that actually our education, as far as nature is concerned, is complete when we are 21 years old. But even before that, we do not require the, as much of the schooling as we think we do. We are educated in fallacies. We are ed educated in mistakes. We are given a reward, a degree, a recognition for doing the wrong thing. We are given honors and values in life to become important and heroic personalities by making mistakes. Actually, the entire theory of our world, as it is at the present time, is the victory of the unimportant over the essential. And as long as it remains that way, we're in trouble. Now, if we want to start in from the inside out, we have to recognize definitely that what is lying within us is actually a form of natural intellect. It is a form of, of intelligence that is based upon what is locked in the cells and in the tissues and in the substances which we bring with us into birth. Each of the little cells in our body it has an intelligence of its own. All these intelligences become together great groups of populations within ourselves. When we break the rules, the individual cell suffers. When we break the rules badly enough, the whole structure suffers. And when we allow exploitation to cause us to live badly, we destroy the entire pattern of our own survival. There's only one way in which we can achieve that which we most want. And that is, we have to do it right in the first place. And if having done it right, we are able to see the consequences, there will be very little problem of failure to cooperate. But we have set up a vicious mechanism here by rewarding mistakes. We have made the mistake the important thing, and we have not given the necessary understanding of the background of the problem. The average person who goes to school has no idea why humanity exists. He has no idea concerning a spiritual factor in material existence. He has no general comprehension of the rules of life as these differ from the rules of social and political structures. He does not know where he came from, he does not know why he is here, and he has no idea where he is going. And on his compound ignorance, we offer degrees and make brilliant scholars of the people who have never answered any of those questions. It is one of these amazing things that we have created a great hierarchy of well-lettered ignorance. We have made everything subservient not to wisdom, but to the passing advantages of the hour. We are in exactly this position politically today. We are concerned not at all with what is good for the people, but what is advantageous to certain groups within the people. We are not able to decide what constitutes a good government, and therefore we have a bad one. We do not understand why we should work together, so we do not. And yet, how can we be educated without at least a glimmer of realization of the importance of cooperation? How can we become strong and powerful without keeping any ethical rules or accepting any responsibility for our own mistakes? This is why we go back to people like Plato and Aristotle, Pythagoras, to understand something about these principles. And they say there are two ways of being governed. One from the inside, which is right, and the other from the outside, which is wrong and unnecessary. If the inside is right, the outside will be right. If the inside has no chance, is unable to manifest itself, then the outside is almost certain to be corrupt. And in it there are corrections made from the outside. They serve only the needs of the outside. 
And that part of the individual which is within himself and most valuable is still neglected. So we say to ourselves, this golden peace that we are all seeking is inside of our own nature. We bring with it, bring it with us into birth. We live with it all our lives. Occasionally we let a moment of it come through, but we become frightened with our own audacity and go back again to the shelter of the herd, to the shelter of the conventions of the many, with no regard for the integrity of the life within ourselves. Now, as a result of this type of attitude, and this type of solution, or lack of it, we produce a world of problems, a world which is getting into a very sticky wicket at the present time. We are on the verge of more trouble, simply because we have never tried to find out what causes trouble. And when we find out what causes it, the answer is ignorance. Now, ignorance is either simple or complex. A simple ignorance is not to know that which is right. Compound ignorance is not to know when we are wrong. We have got to find ways in which to remedy our own mistakes. And this was part of the old philosophy of Egypt. When the time came for the individual to take the rights, to accept maturity, to accept the responsibility of life, and this was also true of the American Indian tribes of this continent. When the time came to become a citizen, the individual is not made one. He becomes one by a dedicated expression of his own integrity. He is put through certain tests and various interesting points of one of them was recorded by Cortez in his conference of Mexico. The Aztecs had a very strong attitude on the subject of drink. Now, we might not assume that pulque or whatever they were drinking in those days was an important. But the Aztecs had a simple rule that any individual under 50 who drank broke law and was punished. There could be no such a thing as a juvenile alcoholic because if the individual drank under the age of 50, then he was punished. If after 50, he took a little now and then, it was condoned. He was no longer a, a rule. It was because it was assumed that he was tired, that he was maybe a little infirm, a little discouraged with life, and it was all different. But youth could not do it. This is an interesting rule. Supposing we made it impossible for anyone uh, under 50 to sin without being punished that they wouldn't have any institution room for them. We wouldn't be able to live with ourselves. And yet the principle is just part of nature, that you want youth to support the nation. You want young people to grow, to build, to create. And if you fill them up with some kind of alcoholic liquid or narcotics or something of that nature, you destroy the future of the country. The Aztecs knew this, Apparently, we haven't got quite up to that yet. We are still suffering from self-imposed ignorance. So we start in and we study the problems of mind. Now, what is mind's primary situation? What is the mind here to do? It is here to lead the compound of the body toward the growth which nature demands. The mind is given to us that we may think straight that we may have the courage to grow. It gives us also the impulse to learn more by the consideration of the phenomena of life around us. It is all part of the pattern of maturity. The mature person is thoughtful, responsible, and eager to learn that which is necessary and right. The mature person expects to control habits, expects to put principles above personality. All these things are possible when the mind leads the body. If, however, the mind becomes simply a slave of the pressures of the animal kingdom, then we no longer have this situation. The mind becomes the arch conspirator. The mind makes all kinds of wonderful plans 
for the simple purpose of taking the individual away from his own integrity. He has no solid ground of integrity. So here we should begin with what constitutes education. We should have yet the world working with this problem. The world should be working with the concept that education is learning to be a citizen of the world. And that the world that is made up of educated people can go on for a thousand years without a war. Because wars are all the result of the acceptance of ignorance. They are the result of breaking laws, breaking the rules, and, and uh, employing vital uh, means, violent means, of accomplishing what should be attained by the kindness of spirit. So in the uh, development of, these, of civilization, the problem comes, what should we teach the young? Well, it's good to teach them the alphabet, I guess. We have to communicate with each other. Of course, we hardly have to have to read and write anymore. That's all computerized. We hardly have to make any decisions of importance. They're all classical, developed along lines of prevailing patterns. Now we see, for instance, the problem with the computer. Here we have a very useful device. And the development and invention of it had to come from within because it represents the use of exact rules that the individual and community existence put together has worked out for a number of years. It is therefore a hopeful thing, something that can bring usefulness and bring education and bring enlightenment to people. So, how are we going to use it? Probably the same way we use television. We're going to abuse it. We're going to exploit it. We're going to make it the basis of a wave of crime. We have never known the likes of which before. We are going to take this thing that might be useful, and because we are ignorant, we will destroy it. And the mere fact that we are scientific enough to invent it does not mean that we are moral enough not to abuse it. So somewhere there, there is a skill to do, and the ignorance to do wrong. These things will have become very important in the study of the mental life of the human being. So we have all these different things to consider, and one the man not long ago observed in the press that in all probability the school system can only educate up to the grammar school, and after the grammar school, schools have practically nothing to give. Because the moment you get beyond the very simple facts of life, you get into interpretation which forced to vicious misuse. You go into a school, a high school, a college, a university, not because we are primarily concerned with the good of humanity, but because we are primarily concerned with the advancement of personal career. And selfishness is really the end of integrity on almost every level of human function. So we are now on the verge of trying to find out a little more about how the mind can help us in this extremity. The mind gradually evolves in this body. It is very often limited by heredity. It is limited by lack of opportunity. It is limited by economic conditions, social conditions, political hierarchies of one kind or another. But it is here to help us to grow. And uh, usually it should be taught before school age. Here brings another serious situation. In other words, integrity has slowly faded away in relationship of human beings to each other. The relationship of marriage is falling apart. The respect of parents and children is no longer stressed. Everyone is on his own, out to do his own thing, out to waste time. We've had a number of young people have come to me to try to find out some of the problems that they face. And most of them are troubled with one basic value, that they wish to do as they please, that they wish to be themselves, and by themselves they meant to drink whenever they felt like it. 
by themselves they meant to, how to break all the rules without being punished. It was never the point of themselves trying to lead them to a better way. They did not recognize the internal factor of growth, and they did not realize that the abuse and misuse of this inner factor was the resulting in physical and emotional distress. The moment the mental factor does not, does not retain leadership over the life, the life begins to fall apart. And leadership is not the ability to put the scheme through. Leadership is not skilled to exploit. Leadership is the understanding and insight to abuse and protect faculties and bodies from abuse. The moment the mind abuses the physical body, problems start. It becomes the same thing as a country falling under a dictator. This dictator with only one point in mind, his own advantage, is represented in the body by the determination to do what we please, regardless of whether it is right or wrong. We then expect the body to cooperate. The body will never cooperate with that which is wrong, because it has no experience of wrong ever being right. But it will continue to struggle against the pressures of misuse. The result is, is uh, continuous breakdown, continuous corruption, and continuous failure of the body to cooperate. Little by little, we, gra we gradually destroy the power of the mind to lead the body. And when this power is lost, we become into serious problems. And so we may say with some of the Oriental people, what is the mind? Is, is it some little no nobule somewhere in the compound of human beings that has a kind of skill, power, or energy, an inevitable resource to lead the rest? I think the answer to this is that in all the kingdoms of nature, there are experiences. Minerals have experience. Although we probably don't know what it is, never will know. But we did know once. Animals have experience. Plants have experience. And they have the experience of natural things, and they have the experience of man-made corruption of nature. Nature knows what's wrong with us long before we find it out. Nature also realizes the care with which we will avoid doing the right thing. So we may all, through the, the development of the individual, through the, the cycles of rebirth, through the processes of evolution, there is an internal integrity built up within us. There is a center in which all useful knowledge is preserved. There is a reference bank. There is something which is available but seldom called upon. There is the experience of the past to lead to the future. This experience has nothing to do with the fulfillment of our personal desires, except perhaps to explore us expose their futility. But this experience is down to thousands of years of evolution. We have gradually come to know what can be done and what cannot be done, and what we should be thinking instead of what we are thinking. So this is the center of record, this reference center, this library in which all the records of our own existence are kept, is locked in what we call the memory sequences, or in the mind. So the mind is what it is because it has learned everything that it could learn up to the present level of its growth. Therefore, we can say that it's like a wise old man living on the top of a hill somewhere, an old guru. And the, the disciples and the students all go to hear him and to learn from him and to, le and to gain wisdom from his instruction. So we have within ourselves the guru, the super guru, the teacher that can tell us exactly what is wrong with ourselves, exactly what we have done that is not right, and why we did it, and how we are in danger of repeating the mistake. So we have this source. And the attainment of contact with it is very largely through what we now call meditational discipline. Meditation in the sense of be still and know. We find this as a scriptural statement. We know that an I am God. Now, by being still, we mean for a moment or two to 
keep my peace with our own utility. By being at peace, we mean not selfish for a little while. Forgetting self, forgetting ambition, forgetting to defend ourselves, forgetting to hate, forgetting to misplace our affections and emotions. In other words, to let the inside out, you've got to quiet down the outside. You cannot expect the inner consciousness to function if you are constantly screaming about this, yelling about that, howling about something else, and hating everything in sight. All of this paralyzes the body, destroys its function, and leads to sickness. But by being quiet and letting ambition slow down for a moment, we can find what's behind it. We can find why we were given an equipment which is capable of achieving wonderful things if we will not get in its own way. But when we take this achieving process and pervert it, use it merely to aggrandize our own selfishness, then we are in serious trouble. So the beginning of the search for reality uh, is to keep quiet and see what we really need and not just what we want, to find out why, where duty lies and why we shouldn't escape it, to discover what constitutes the fulfillment of life as we can live it, and not the ambition to be something we are not capable of being at the present time. So by being still and not allowing the outside to dictate to us all the time, we begin to develop the philosophic calm. Pythagoras uh, recognized from this point and recommended a silence for five years. By the end of that time, the individual ought to know that the world can get along without his making a lot of noise. Most of all, however, the individual has had time to think things through, to make a thorough analysis of himself. Uh, Apollonius of Tyana, the uh, Thermocurgis, uh, of the of the Alexandrian period, made a made a Pythagorean life for himself. He took on voluntarily, although the Pythagoras had been dead for over five centuries, took on the uh, silence, the five year of silence. And around the midst of this five year of silence, there was a great emergency arise. A big fight was started somewhere. Another wall was in the making, and they all rushed to. Apollonius had begged him to prevent this from happening. Now, it was a critical moment. He was vowed to silence, and how is he going to help to prevent this emergency from happening? So he went out, and he stood between the two parties, and he very quietly blessed both, but never spoke. And the peace and greatness of his calmness was so impressive that the war was called off. This is the Pythagorean approach. Emergencies cease or become much less if we do not build them. If we build on an insult, it can become a huge. If we build upon a selfish want, we will become in the end the want everything. If we cater to a weakness of character, in time that weakness will take over. Therefore, in all emergencies where we want to get the best advice there is, we be still and know that we can find something that is better. And this leads us again to something else, which we'll talk about next time. And that is the problem of what happens when the mind does come to peace and becomes a servant in its turn of something higher. At the moment, however, the mind is our consideration, and we need it very badly. We need to have a new construction of, of education. Now, we're talking very much about the difficulties of, of, of maintaining the present pattern of school. The, uh, the individuals who go through the school may be able to get a job, but they have nothing else, and there's no certainty that they are going to get a job because of computerization and other inventions developed as rapidly as they are at the present time, no amount of schooling can save the individual from ultimately being unemployed. It is going to be a very difficult thing to fix, to fix this all together. But the real thing is 
that if average person understands the possibility of a full and happy life without dominating someone else, we are very much on the way towards security. It is not necessary that every human being must go to become a professional, a, a politician, lawyer, a doctor. It isn't necessary that we have a position in which we are opulent sufficiently so that we can dominate financially other people. There is no possibility, as was pointed out in Sparta 3,500 years ago, there is no possibility of peace or integrity in a country or in a world in which 90% of the available assets are in the hands of 10% of the people. This cannot be. We know this. Uh, everyone who is even taking a course in academic philosophy knows this. But nothing happens. No one thinks about applying these principles to the present emergency unless, by application, we immediately improve our own economic status. If it makes us rich quick, we will try to do it. Otherwise, let somebody else. So we go towards a new century here in which, for all intent and purposes, the challenge is to place the higher aspects of man, of mind, the Arupa Manas, in control of the intellectual life of the person. The time has come to realize that the, that the intellect is not materialistic. There's another problem, because many people think that the thinker it must be materialistic because all ideals are imaginary. This is untrue. The mistakes are imaginary. And we are building every day houses, as we sometimes call, on the second floor over a vacant lot. We have not yet recognized the simple fact that, the, that an education is the release of integrity into manifestation. It is allowing things to grow in their proper order. It is the possibility of reaching out across the interval and shaking hands. Every step towards confusion is a retrograde motion. Every irritation, every political uproar, every war, and then the uh, material or economic disaster is a proof of wrong. It is the fact that we are not getting the facts of life. Um, Aiken points this out clearly, very definitely, in the, his Novum Organum, that the actual answer to all these things must be that when we look over the world as it is, we see that the world as it is is unselfish, intelligent, cooperative, and kind. And so it's these things, we haven't got a world. We have one. The world, nothing wrong with the world. The, the tulips still grow in the fields. There's what left of them. The forest is still here until we finally cut them all down. We have a little petroleum left, but not, we're wasting it pretty heavily at this time. But all these things are here. And yet, at the time when we had all we needed of all of them, we had no peace. If we had our two oil wells, we wanted our neighbor's well also. We are now out taking new strategies to how to control somebody else and their and money, and success is measured entirely on this basis. Will the mind inside of us, the intellect, the uh, actual inner intelligence, the intellectual part of our nature, knows that this is wrong? And yet, knowing it is wrong, it has no way of making this fact available. It does not have the cell will gradually destroy the very things we consider most important. After a while, the mind, sickened by this procedure, gives up the fight. It simply collapses of its own pressures. And we have the individual who goes to narcotics and then later commits suicide or dies as a result of drugs. These things are not reasonable in a world such as we live in. This is not a terrible distort civilization. It is a bunch of selfish people suffering. It is a group of mistakes ruling a world that is tired of mistakes. It goes on and on and on because no one settles down to the essential values of living. 
And that brings us, of course, to the philosophic empire. That brings us to the point of trying to use love knowledge to live rather than to use it to kill. If we use half as much energy building as we do use now tearing down, we would have a very different world. Now, nature is going to keep on with this procedure. Nature is going to keep on showing us what happens when we misuse a blessed truth. That we take the power of the mind within ourselves to lead us in ways of peace and tranquility and insist on misusing it, corrupting it, and changing it into a gangster. We do this not because the mind itself actually changes. The mind still sends out what little message it can. But in, in a moment that message is brought to the consciousness, the consciousness begins to figure out how to apply it selfishly and continue the destructive procedure. Now in the Indian philosophy, which is pretty well mature, we find that the Arupa Manas, or the higher mind, is a repository of the ego itself that part of the individual which we call the person. The person, therefore, rests in the field of mind. At the time of decarnation, it passes out of the physical body to the etheric zone, to the emotional body, and finally comes to the mental body. And as it ascends to the mental body, it goes to sleep. It goes to sleep because it has not yet gained the vibratory strength to continue to exist consciously in the, in the higher atmosphere of the mind. When he goes to sleep, when he can no longer uh, be conscious as the mind wants to be conscious. In other words, it stays stay awake to those levels of the mind which are selfish and self-centered. But when it comes to the humanitarian impulses, the universal sympathies and understanding, the mind simply goes to sleep. It doesn't go to sleep because it fails. It goes to sleep simply because it has no vehicle to work with. If the lower mind is not developed, the higher mind cannot manifest to it. And as the higher mind must manifest to, to, to vitalize the mental level of human activity, unless the, the mind we work with every day begins to understand the principle of mind, which we are constantly forgetting, overlooking, and denying, it cannot continue to guide us consciously the way we want to go or have to go. So when we go higher than uh, the, our material thinking can carry us, we go to sleep. And we remain asleep until we begin the descent again into another chain of bodies. We cannot be conscious above the understanding which is involved in consciousness. We have the mind. We are the only form of life that we know visibly that has consciousness as we have it, that has a mental nature, has a power to say yes and no to any value that comes to it. It is the power, as St. Augustine also pointed out, that is the power of decision. It is the power to be right instead of wrong. It is the power to recognize virtue and not fall into the pitfalls of ignorance. So ignorance continues to press in on us from the outside. And intelligence is kind of trying to work its way out through us into the environment. And we have the troubled landscape that we see today. The landscape which is also a personal uh, environment for each and every person. Now, if we're going to start this business of the mind, we must begin to think about what the mind would like to do. Now, the, the answer must be, finally, the mind would like to be right. The mind would like to do that which is best for itself and the combination of bodies through which it functions. The purpose of the mind, therefore, is to keep the peace, to use all of its energies for constructive purposes, the man to develop gradually an internal integrity that is strong enough to withstand the pressures of external temptation. So we can start in with the knowledge we have a mind, and we will then begin to try to use it. And we may be surprised how little we can use it, because we have never trained it. Uh, there's one division that we have 
that is rather interesting, and that is that we have objective and we have reflective powers. In other words, the mind observes what is on, going on the outside and reflects upon that in terms of the important changes that must be made within itself. <coughs> in the in phonology, uh, the objective observing powers are located in the front of the head, above the eyes. The reflectives are at the front of the head and toward the back. And the higher the head, the more likely there is to have a, a reflective practice in the mind. But the mind takes what happens and says, what do we do about it? So let's take an example of this. The objective or observing faculty to see a home breaking up. They see all the causes of this breakup. So, in our present thinking, this neighbor is having this problem. Doesn't seem much we can do about it anyway. So finally we say to ourselves, well, I guess we're going to break up and that's it. And if it happens to ourselves, we say the same thing. Well, we can't get along, so I guess the thing to do is to break it up. Everybody gets, gets free again, makes more mistakes, we may be. Then we go around and uh, the reflective power has no chance to work. Because the reflective power would show that a crisis is an opportunity. It means it's a chance to grow. Wherever there's a problem, there is a tendency to avoid, but there is also the possibility of using the problem to solve a, an absence or a vacancy in our own ethics. So if we are able to quietly think through the problem, we can come to a better sense of growth. The reflective power is therefore the ability to thoroughly understand what is happening, why it is happening, and why it will happen again if we don't do something about it. So every lesson is either an emergency or a lesson. If it's a lesson, it is something to be faced. And if the individual is completely without reflective power, then it is something to be avoided or to be cast away without thought. Every day we have problems. Most of the time, we try to get rid of them without thinking them through. Therefore, we do nothing to enrich the mental processes within ourselves. If we think the thing through and find the mind giving us the proper answer, we have then made a lesson out of a problem. And then the other way around, we made a problem out of a lesson. It's all depend largely on our own reaction. So the reflective powers of the mind are those that take objective facts, so-called, or objective circumstances, and then sow them with realities. They show us why. They are great lessons. The lesson that we learn from an, ex an experience is far more important than one that we can learn from a book. We have to know all of the elements by quietly considering them. And if we consider them, we will reflect upon them. Now, uh, Pythagoras had this retrospective exercise to help us in this reflection. He said that every day before we go to bed, we should sit down very quietly and review the day and say to ourselves, what does the immortal soul that is in me gain from this day? How have I grown? How have I done something right that I did wrong some other time? And how do I do, why did I do something today that was wrong? when I should have done something that was right. To study the day is to change a day from a happening to an experience, to a means of growth, to a way of becoming something more than we were. And by following the Pythagorean suggestion, uh, we gain a great deal. Now, there are a lot of uh, metaphysical disciplines being exercised at the present time, but not many people that I know of are studying actually a recompense for their own mistakes. We are not sitting down to try to find out what we did wrong. What we're really sitting down for is to learn how to meditate to get something we want. And this is the usual misuse of religion. This is how religion got into trouble in the first place. It became a matter of acceptance and a strength to do as we please rather than an encouragement to learn to do what we should. So if we have a problem come up, retrospection is helpful. 
It helps us to think things through, to see what we did that we should not have done, and to give us the strength and courage not to do it again. Now, there have been several schools of thought on this concerning religion. We, the problem with religion as to how we should use it. Well, we have done with religion, if we go carefully, very much what we've done with everything else, politics, medicine, law, all these things. We have gradually transformed religion from a source of strength to a cover for weakness. We have gradually made religion justify what we want instead of what we need. Religion, therefore, has become a means of, again, blocking the natural growth of our internal integrity. It has given us the opportunity to call a mistake a, a divine experience and to pray to God to excuse us from faults that we should have corrected ourselves. And from the experience we learn another thing, that God will not correct the experiences that we need to correct ourselves. The divine theory principle in religion is that it will strengthen our strength, but it will not pardon our weakness. The idea of religion as a constant forgiveness of something is part of the illusion that we are suffering from today. It is not that religion should mistake uh, to pray for or uh, excuse all our mistakes. The purpose of religion is to make ourselves strong enough in principle so that we do not make the mistakes. In every case, the miracle that we think of, the improvement that we dream of, comes from the strength of character. If faith is strong enough in us to make us do right, then we are working in the right direction. If it is merely a bomb in Gilead to take care of doing what is wrong, then we have no very, very, very little hope to gain through it. Now, we've got the mind problem with science. What about science? Is science something that is entirely apart from life? Is science something the mind cannot control? Or is the mind to be ultimately a scientist? Is it to be scientific? No, unless we understand science. The word science has a note of exactitude about it we often think of. It has a sense of being infallibly right. But it is not infallibly right. It is infallibly skillful but it is very largely devoted to the support of that which is not right, and therefore we cannot afford to accept it completely. Science, therefore, is means to recognize laws in things, rules. The scientist knows the rules of astronomy, he knows the rules of physics and biology, he knows the rules of, of medicine. There are rules and there are laws. Hippocrates is close was one of the first to develop the laws of, me of medicine. But he pointed out then, at that time, that the beginning of healing, the beginning of medicine, was that the individual could correct the mistakes within his own nature. The individual who put his faith in the integrity of life would get better healing than the person who wanted to remain sick but was too sick to dissipate until he got over it. All the time, the, uh, the rules are the same. Hippocrates pointed out that in order to have the gods come and help us, in order that the Asclepian uh, deities could be healing us, we must approach them with prayer. We must approach them with dedication. And we must resolve within ourselves to make right the thing that caused the sickness, if it is within our power to do so. And whether it is within our power or not, we should learn to accept the healing power of improvement, of correction, of dedication, and of the building of a new life as a reward for the protection of the old one. All these things come back to an ethics system. An ethics system is the final judging by mind. Ethics is one of the highest levels of mental integrity. Ethics is something that we should all practice, we should all understand, we all should all recognize. And it makes no difference whether ethics is the government of the world, the government of a nation, the government of a city, of a family, 
or the government of, a, of the individual within himself and the body which he inhabits. Ethics is the basis of obedience, and it is also the proof of dedication. It is the proof that the individual is determined to do that which is right. And when we do that which is right, we have a much better opportunity to enjoy the security of a well-ordered existence instead of being constantly torn apart by the pressures of society. So we say the mind now is, uh, well, it's a mysterious thing. One religion says the mind is the slayer of the real. The mind is not really the slayer of the real. It is the mind functioning through a brain that is dedicated to selfishness. The use of the most priceless energy, energy that we have, is something to be thought about. In other words, mind is our, one of our highest energies. It is the basis of our deepest relationship with life. It is the foundation of a new and better understanding of everything that makes up living. Therefore, when we abuse that, we abuse the greater good, and the abuse of the greater good is the greater ill. Uh, Ill. So we have to use the mind, but we have to purify it. We have to judge ourselves day by day and see how we get on. We have to make sure that at least a part of our life is devoted to something that is worthwhile. Now, the mind is sensitive to suffering. It is sensitive to the sorrows of society. It is sensitive to the wars and to the crimes and to the mysteries and misery. But for the average person, there's very little they can do about all this. The only thing they can do immediately is to apply it to the immediate environment of themselves. They can apply it, and sometimes, having applied it in this way, they are inspired to a larger and greater dedication. And every generation has a few yet magnificently dedicated souls who live to improve and serve. And they are the successful ones. The successful one is not with the money in the bank. The successful is with virtue in the great universal treasury of life. The more, the more good we can accomplish with the aid of our thoughts and our dedication, the better off we are. There is no conflict between the mind and the emotion if both are normal. The idea that you've got to be kind of stony-hearted in order to be an intellectual is exactly what it is. If you want to be an intellectual, but that isn't what you ought to be. You ought to be in control of the intelligible realities of life. There is no reason why a, a, a scientist should not be just as gentle, just as kindly, just as thoughtful, and just as affectionate as anyone else. Learning does not deny any virtue. Knowledge does not cause us to be less in some other part in order to be greater in one particular. Therefore, the more we know, the more we understand life. The more we understand life, the more sensitive we are to the sorrows of life. And the scientist who is without emotion and without integrity is really not a scientist at all. Because a scientist must be heart and mind together, not one at the expense of the other. All the way along, mind leads the body, and the soul leads the mind. The most important thing we have to do with most of us is to begin our education where it should have begun when we were ten years old. But the way we were live now, we never had a chance. Therefore, we have to pick it at any time at all that it comes along. Some of us may have to go to school in our 70s or 80s. Others may have to go to school on their deathbed. But everyone has to do it. And somewhere along the line, we must all make this partnership. We must all use the mind as a guardian upon action, a guardian upon mistakes, something that whispers to us, don't do it, it isn't best. If we can gradually develop this protection, if we can gradually gain this power to discriminate, we will find that our enemies fade away and our friends become closer and the people who don't understand will either gain understanding or drift to company like themselves. We cannot make people understand. But most people today are having tragedies. Most nations today are sick. Most families are broken and divided. And in these emergencies are the preparations for the 21st century. 
to the 21st century will come when we cannot undo the mistakes we made in the 20th century. We either get over them or they destroy us. So we now look back almost upon a century, almost, of mistakes that have been made, not by people who wanted to do it wrong, but people who never had any realization of what was right. They were all influenced and indoctrinated by mass attitudes. They were all trying to succeed because others succeeded. They were all criticizing because others criticized. And they did not realize that while it is perfectly proper to recognize the mistakes of others, it is much more important to correct our own than criticize someone else's. All the way along, we are building towards a new century, a century that is not far away now. We are coming to a time when, as Nostradamus pointed out, we are going to have a start to start a new way. He said that in the early years of the 21st century, the paraclete or the Prince of Peace will come. And this paraclete, this Prince of, Prince of Peace, will not, not be regarded as a person. It is the embodiment of a virtue, the embodiment of an understanding. It is a realization in the mind and heart of a better way of being things. And when we get that, we're going to begin to put the world together again. The day of selfishness is coming to a close. The day in which security is going to be rested in material things is very nearly ended. We're going to finally find that we are all secure, although we don't, don't know it. And because we do not believe that we are secure, we fight desperately to gain security by means that are totally insecure. Actually, the security we seek is in ourselves, it always has been, and it always will be. There will never be a moment when integrity is not innate, when there is not within ourselves the spark of a divine purpose. There is never a time when we cannot call upon something better than our present level of conduct if we wish to grow and be a better citizens, a better parents, and better members of society. Peace is in our hearts and always has been. It will be in our minds and always will be and will never cease bothering us until we attain peace. Then we will discover we could have had it in the first place, only we were slow of learning, to use a phrase from the Shemonite dream. We are slow of learning, and the result is pain. And the pain will continue until the learning heals it. And the learning is that the mind will be used to help advance the good in all things to keep the peace, to establish friendships and fellowships, and to do all that is possible to reveal the tremendous potential of human insight and understanding if we give it a chance. If we want to get peace in our side, we've got to educate the values of peace in our lives. And when we do that, we'll realize that we will touch within ourselves a tremendous reservoir of integrity. The, the mind has been waiting for ages for the chance to be itself, and it has always been blocked by the selfishness of little people. So we've got to get over that, and if we can do that, we'll have a pretty good time. Well, I guess that's all for today.